Hello everybody, uh, my name's Gary Wills and welcome to episode 33 of my YouTube channel. Today we're dealing with the assault on Fort Morgrave, Toulon in December 1793, illustrated here with this lovely painting. <coughs> this uh, video is in support of my latest book, Throwing Thunderbolts, A Wargamer's Guide to the War of the First Coalition, 1792-1797. Uh, and in fact, it is one of the 10 scenarios in the book. I took this game to the other partisan in Newark in the UK uh, last uh, October. And here you can see the uh, leaflet that I used on the day on the left and on the right, the, uh, the poster that I used to uh, illustrate the game and tell people what was going on. And I'm gonna to refer to these uh, documents as we go through the um, uh, the video. The background to the scenario is that uh, in the summer of 1793, the uh, French counter-revolutionaries or federalists in Toulon, um, which was the home of the French Mediterranean fleet, rebelled against the government in Paris and uh, they sought the protection of the British Mediterranean fleet and uh, the Allies uh, shipped in a load of troops to try and hold Toulon uh, in the face of the inevitable uh, Republican backlash. And uh, this uh, scenario is part of the final assault by the French Republicans on Toulon uh, to uh, force the Allies to withdraw. It's uh, mainly famous uh, these days because a certain chef de bataillon, uh, Napoleone di Buonaparte, um, took part in the, uh, the storming of uh, Fort Morgrave. Uh, and it was his plan, uh, allegedly, to, uh, as a way of getting the, uh, the Allies out of uh, Toulon. Because from Fort Morgrave and the forts around it, uh, they could bombard the Allied shipping and make the harbour untenable. Uh, as you can see on the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, cartoons to the or the paintings to the right and the left, uh, Napoleon also got wounded during the uh, uh, during the assault. Um, however, I somewhat prefer. This image, uh, which shows a more grainy, uh, uh, grey uh, image of the mass assault by the French columns overseen on, on the left by uh, a represent, uh, representative of the people uh, making sure the generals did their stuff. And this is the uh, painting from the beginning, which uh, I think makes it clear that once Fort Mulgrave in the centre of the foreground has fallen, uh, the shipping in the uh, harbour uh, was very vulnerable to the cannons that guarded the harbour entrance that the French Republicans would take possession of as a result of this assault. So this is my rendering of the Care Peninsula uh, where Fort Mulgrave was uh, in 15 millimetre scale or size and uh, I've used as you can see a lot of Calistra um, hexon terrain to create this. And for the scenario this is the order of battle um, and uh, the uh, it's, it's titled the Spanish and Allied um, uh, order of battle because actually the guy in charge uh, in the Redoute Saint-Charles was uh, uh, Don Domingo Izquierdo, uh, who uh, was uh, obviously Spanish. But there were troops from the UK, or Great Britain as it was then, uh, Sardinia, uh, Spain and Naples uh, in uh, scattered around the uh, uh, peninsula, as I'll show you. So starting off with Fort Mulgrave, here you can see the big black, brown blodge in the in the mental in the center, I'll show a close up in a minute. This was uh, uh, garrisoned by obviously the artillery uh, from both the Royal Artillery and the Royal Navy, and uh, a, a 
a, a mixture of Sardinian troops from the second de Corton and, and uh, three different uh, foot regiments uh, from Great Britain as well as some Marines. Uh, the guy in charge of the redoubt was supposed to be Captain Colony, uh, but uh, he absconded early on and was replaced by Valmoral of the 30th. And here you can see a close up of my rendering of Fort Mulgrave uh, with the artillery at the front of the, the redoubt and the infantry behind them. Uh, and a close-up shot still of the of the Fort Mulgrave Redoubt, uh, one, and highlighting one of the issues. We know that originally there were 19 cannon uh, in the Redoubt, um, may, uh, including three howitzers, some big uh, naval guns, and some smaller uh, uh, field guns. One of the things that's unclear is exactly how many of those guns uh, survived the uh, pre-assault bombardment by the batteries that Napoleon had arrayed around the, the fort. Um, at, uh, at the other partisan where I demonstrated this, I used uh, uh, three um, models to represent those, um, which uh, is at the scale of this game, probably about represents 15 guns. In this replay, I used four models, so uh, um, uh, a more full of strength, and uh, that may have had some impact on the result of the game. And you can see in the top right-hand corner, um, using the uh, black powder and the manicature, how the guns are represented around the fortress. And you can see in the top left of this photograph the uh, a picket line that the Allies threw out in front of the uh, redoubt and uh, this is represented by a couple of tiny units. Uh, uh, the British component uh, I've assumed was the first 30th because they lost the most casualties of men missing so uh, I assume they would have been uh, overwhelmed in the picket line. In the top of this picture in the centre, you can see uh, my representation of another redoubt, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, unfinished at the time of the action. Uh, it was named the Redoute Saint-Philippe, but it was uh, uh, not occupied and was unfinished. Behind Fort Mulgrave, there were two other redoubts, Redoubt Saint-Charles, and uh, on the right of this picture, Redoubt St. Louis. Redoubt St. Charles was uh, garrisoned by troops from uh, um, Spain and Naples, and uh, as shown here. And the, uh, the artillery was actually battalion guns, uh, four pounders. Near the coast was uh, on the right was Redoubt St. Louis. And this was garrisoned by uh, Spanish troops. And uh, uh, these in the real battle did very well and gave uh, Victor a hard time. So uh, I gave those uh, tough fighters uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as an attempt to reflect that in, in this game. And that's represented by the uh, orange um, uh, markers by each unit. At the bottom of the uh, photograph here, you can see the prizes that the French were really after, uh, from which they could uh, bombard uh, uh, the Allied shipping in the harbour. Uh, on the right is the Fort de l'Aiguillette, uh, which is garrisoned by uh, Neapolitan troops, uh, uh, their marines and gunners. And on the left, we have Fort Balaguer, which is uh, garrisoned by Spanish troops, although small in number. So now it's time to look at the uh, setup of the French forces in the corner uh, of this uh, photograph. This shows their order of battle, and the very competent de Gumier uh, was in charge, and he divided his forces into uh, 
four columns or three columns and a reserve and uh, we'll go through those um, uh, in the upcoming photographs. The interesting thing is his better troops uh, were held back in the third column and the reserve. So here's Dugumier um, uh, on his uh, large stand uh, position so they could offer a reroll uh, uh, to Brule and uh, Delaborde in this instance. So we'll start here um, with uh, Victor's column. Yeah, it is uh, the future Marshal of France, uh, Victor. And uh, he had uh, three battalions, uh, including uh, one Royal Battalion, the 2nd uh, 23rd Regiment, plus two uh, battalions of uh, volunteers. Uh, the fourth uh, battalion here is a converged battalion of tirailleurs det deducted from the other battalions, uh, so, that they, uh, so that they have some skirmish capability should they want to use it. So Chef de Brigade Nicolas Brule uh, uh, led the second column. Again, similar to the first, had uh, three battalions of uh, uh, infantry, although in this case they're all uh, volunteer battalions and a converged group of tirailleurs. So behind them we had Delabor, who uh, is famous uh, for his uh, fighting in the peninsula against Wellington. And uh, he had uh, two battalions of volunteers and a converged grenadier battalion from the Army des Alpes. So the grenadier companies uh, were merged together uh, to form these battalions and some tirailleurs. And finally at the back we have uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, commanding the reserve and uh, he had two battalions of volunteers, big battalions and some tirailleurs. Uh, obviously uh, slightly different to the uh, posters of him but he did get into action which gives you some idea of how fought, hard fought this uh, whole uh, exercise was. Here's uh, an overview, sh uh, overview shot of the French force lined up ready to go and uh, this gives us a chance to say that uh, a lot of these French troops are either uh, chariot miniatures from Magister Militum uh, as these are or uh, their minifigs uh, from their French uh, revolutionary range. Uh, there are both uh, in the setup. And here's some more uh, chariot miniatures, this time a, 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 a battalion of uh, uh, French volunteers uh, with their nice flag. Uh, the Allied troops uh, were from a variety of manufacturers. Um, as you can imagine, it was pretty dark, difficult pulling together Spanish, Sardinian and Neapolitan troops, but uh, some of them use uh, French infantry from uh, uh, the uh, chariot miniatures, uh, uh, American War of Independence range. Uh, some are miniature figurines, certainly the British are all miniature figurines and so on. And there are various odd ones uh, in, in there. So a word on scales, I'm old, so I believe in scales, even though uh, uh, most people these days seem to ignore them. Uh, for me, this, on the table, uh, I use one millimetre to two paces, and uh, that means the table is approximately one and a half by one miles uh, in dimensions. Uh, my Bruce Quarry um, Heritage uh, shows through that I always use a one figure to 33 men uh, figure scale. And uh, from my understanding of how, how black powder works, the, the, uh, the turn, a pair of turns, French and Allied, represents about 15 minutes of real time on average. Uh, we're playing with black powder second edition. So the uh, thing I haven't mentioned uh, about this scenario is that the assault took place at night, um, and a fact of one in the morning. And uh, so consequently, I needed some uh, visibility rules that would uh, 
cover the sort of variable stormy nature of the um, of the of the evening. And the way I decided to do this was for each uh, uh, brigade. So that would mean each of the French columns plus the uh, Allied uh, brigade, which was all one brigade, the Allied garrison. They each threw on their turn uh, 3d6, which gave them a score obviously between one and uh, sorry between three and 18. Center, and that was seen to be their uh, visibility for that brigade for that turn. So you could get quite different results for, for different uh, columns for the French and obviously different again to the Allied. Um, you'll see in the photographs the, the D20 stay on the table all the time. Obviously they only need to be there while the uh, uh, it, the, the particular side is, is having their go, but I left them all the time. Uh, and this does have impact on things like charging and obviously shooting and so on. And uh, uh, it's important to um, uh, understand that this uh, was a real feature on the night. Uh, Although Victor and Brule's uh, columns had different targets, one was targeting Fort Morgrave, the other Fort Louis, they actually bumped into each other uh, as they uh, approached the, the Allies. So the other thing I did is I increased the chance of um, uh, there becoming a blunder under the black powder um, uh, command system. So instead of just generating a blunder on a 12, two sixes. I increased it to two, three, 11 and 12. And uh, that seemed to work for me. It also had the effect of obviously reducing uh, the number of um, uh, three movement turns that the French would get. Uh, seemed to work. I came up with this some time ago. I, I've since really, uh, uh, come across alternatives for this, which uh, wherein uh, every double um, is used as a blunder. Uh, it's uh, not that different in, in a total outcome in the in, in the round, but uh, this was the one I chose. Uh, the other thing I did was I uh, I used an average dice for the result of the blunders, so that meant that the uh, the more extreme uh, options on the blunder chart never happened. So most, pe most people went left or right, uh, as we'll see. So a final word on victory conditions before they start. To win, the French have got to capture two of the three redoubts uh, before the end of ten, turn 24. Uh, so that's uh, Fort Mulgrave itself, or Fort St. Louis, or Fort St. Charles. Um, one redoubt taken is considered a draw um, and uh, anything else would be a, an Allied uh, victory. The other way the Allies can win is by breaking uh, the French army. So that would require two of the French brigades to reach their break points uh, uh, during the game. Uh, and that would result in the, the French, uh, all four French columns withdrawing from the fight. Uh, the uh, breaking of the Allied um, uh, uh, Brigade um, is less decisive in this regard because the redoubts are all defensive positions. So under the rules uh, for black powder, they're, they're not required to retreat uh, like the others, uh, other units. So uh, that really sums it up. Basically, capture the redoubts is what you're about. And so let's start with the game with the uh, French going first. And here's the overview at the end of French term one. In this close up, you can see that Brule's uh, guys on the left got, to, got off to a fairly um, uh, good start, but everybody else was uh, restricted to uh, a one move forward. And uh, in this close up, you can see Brule's uh, columns uh, approaching the uh, picket line uh, of the Allies. And you can also see the uh, transparent tokens behind two of the battalions there, which indicate that um, they're unreliable uh, 
columns here so they don't move when the score is zero. Uh, the red dots, the red counters, uh, identify untested units that uh, they actually were only raised the, the summer before uh, this took place, so within six months. And you can see the two unreliable units in Brulé's uh, uh, column and uh, one in uh, Victor's. So here we are moving on to the end of Allied Turn 1 in Overview. And here you can see uh, in close-up the uh, picket line of the Allies, uh, sensibly withdrawing on initiative in, in the face of the columns uh, while uh, trying to keep them under fire. So here you can see um, the uh, overview at the end of French Turn 2. As an early sign that things weren't going well for the French, uh, on the right of this uh, photograph you can see Victor's four um, columns have veered sharply uh, uh, to their left um, as a result of a blunder. On the left of the, the uh, picture you can see Brulé's columns uh, struggling up the slope uh, towards the uh, picket uh, troops uh, and uh, things get worse before they get better because the, 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 the game works off the, the 30 meter uh, contour uh, marks the beginning of the steeper slopes and rough ground so all movement is halved uh, unless you're a skirmisher above that level. So at this point, the French have stalled to make contact with the retiring piquets. So we're now moving on to uh, Allied Turn 2, and uh, this is the overview. And uh, you can see here uh, the, the, the Allied picket lines are gradually pulling back before the uh, uh, French columns, uh, just beyond initiative charge range, given the half distance. So uh, that enables them to continue to fire and the uh, uh, volunteers of the mountain dakes uh, on the uh, on the right of Brulé's columns uh, from his right uh, already taking casualties from the uh, uh, skirmishers and here you can see in the center of the picture uh, Brulé's tirailleurs have uh, uh, shaken out into uh, skirmish order and, I, and for you, those of you who've seen other of my videos I use these six centimetre bases to uh, try and represent the proper amount of space the skirmishers took up with two or three maybe four figures on per base. So the firing in the previous turn alerted uh, Isguiedo to the, uh, uh, the French attack and so he was able to start moving forward some of his uh, reserve troops as you can see here. So we're now moving on to uh, French turn three. You see the overview at the end of the turn here. So the turn started off with uh, this battalion of French uh, um, volunteers trying to charge and drive off the uh, um, in this case Spanish uh, uh, picket line and uh, obviously the Spanish under the black powder two rules uh, tried to evade but they rolled a two which meant under my rule modifications that uh, they blundered and then they backed that up with a five which meant they advanced and consequently they ended up in contact with um, these uh, um, these French infantry. The French infantry then had a nightmare in the close combat and um, they failed to beat the skirmishers or drive them off. Um, in fact, I think it was uh, a, a draw and, uh, and both sides in good order, so it held over to the, to the next turn. Uh, so extraordinarily, the column has obviously hesitated before actually making contact with the Spanish infantry dispersed around the cover on the hillside. While we're here, we can see Victor's column uh, having um, 
landed last turn failed uh, its reroll this uh, its uh, command roll this time and uh, uh, stayed along on the coast twiddling its thumbs and you can see here with Brulé's uh, columns other two columns uh, f also failing to do much about the um, the uh, the allied skirmishers uh, in this case uh, British and uh, Spanish uh, not getting enough moves to close the gap and, and therefore uh, uh, taking casualties however you can see in the uh, in the redoubt that um, uh, Brule's uh, skirmishers have caused some disorder amongst the Allied artillery. So here you are the situation at the end of Allied turn three in overview. And uh, on Brule's right, you can see the uh, the skirmishers to their front have withdrawn again, keeping outside of uh, initiative uh, charge range. Meanwhile, the other unit of the picket line is uh, still holding its own against the, the French infantry who uh, clearly have uh, chosen not to close to contact. So we have the true definition of uh, close range uh, shooting being the uh, order of the day here. Meanwhile, Izquierdo uh, have failed to get his guys to move any further forward. So here we see the uh, um, situation at the end of French turn four. And finally, uh, Victor has got his men moving forward towards uh, the uh, St. Louis Redoubt. Meanwhile, on the other flank, Bruling has made very hard work of closing on the Allied positions. And in the centre, the uh, picket lines, the Spanish picket line, is continuing its uh, stout work of uh, managing uh, not to uh, be overawed by their French opponents, surviving another round of uh, close combat. So here we are at the end of Allied Turn 4, and you can see the ground in overview. So on the, the left flank, the uh, pickets have uh, continued to pour fire into the slowly moving French columns and the uh, Volunteers de Mountain Dakes uh, on the extreme flank have been shaken by, by the fire of their uh, opponents. Continuing the tale of woe for Brule's uh, column, you can see the Tiraya unit in the centre has, uh, uh, has also become shaken, having received two casualties from the artillery and the, the Spanish uh, skirmishers. Meanwhile, the uh, everlasting combat on the, uh, between the uh, Spanish picket line and the French column has uh, continued, but the Spanish are at least shaken now and in danger of uh, um, defeat. So we now move on to the end of French Term 5, which you can see in overview here. So the key thing that happened uh, on this turn is that Victor got his men organised and uh, charged in with uh, three supports on the uh, Spanish artillery holding the St. Louis Redoubt. They uh, became disordered as they charged in uh, and the Spanish artillery did score two uh, hits on uh, closing fire. Uh, but by virtue of the double six they threw for their saves, uh, they were able to get in and overwhelm the uh, uh, artillery in the close combat. Uh, the way I did the close combat is although both redoubts or all three redoubts had an infantry component and an artillery component, the defenders got to choose whether the infantry or the artillery did uh, the closing fire in the initial melees and uh, obviously artillery are much more dangerous in closing fire so uh, invariably it worked better for the gunners to take the first hits as it were. Finally the uh, French column broke uh, the the piquets who, uh, uh, who were in front of them 
and to disappear off the table. Uh, Brule's uh, battalions uh, still didn't manage to contact uh, in, uh, either their light infantry in front of them or the redoubt because of the, uh, the difficulties of crossing the terrain. And also their tirailleurs withdrew uh, into a safe place because they were already shaken and disordered and therefore uh, staying in front of the artillery would uh, uh, only lead to bad things. So here we are at the end of Allied Turn 5 and you can see this in overview here. So while the uh, the second 23rd had broken into the uh, redoubt they still faced uh, combat from the tough fighters of the Spanish infantry and their supporting unit are arriving on their flank to try and do some damage. Here you can see that uh, Brule's uh, command has become quite split and a big gap has opened up uh, where the Turayos were. So this uh, turn turned into a big disaster for the French because uh, the, the from shooting from the Spanish and uh, so, sorry, the Allied tirailleurs in their picket line uh, broke the uh, Montendaix battalion uh, and uh, they failed their first uh, uh, break test, which is not very good. And because the Tirailleur battalion in Brulé's brigade was already um, uh, shaken, uh, it meant that uh, Brulé's brigade as a whole was broken and uh, they would uh, were no longer part of the fighting. So now we're moving on to the end of French turn six and this shows you an overview of all the action. So looking at uh, Victor's uh, column first you can see that in the St Louis redoubt there's still fighting going on uh, but the defenders uh, the infantry defenders this time are now shaken um, while to their left their supporting battalion has been charged by a French column and forced back and is also now shaken. Uh, on the uh, other flank you can see Brulé's men, what's left of them, uh, starting to fall back and be replaced uh, by Delaborde's uh, column on at the top of the or in the middle of the picture and Napoleon's reserves uh, at the bottom of the picture. So we're now moving on to uh, the end of Allied Turn 6, which you can see an overview here. And here you can see around the St. Louis Redoubt, although the Redoubt is still held by the uh, Spanish um, and uh, they're fighting off the French attack, uh, their supporting battalion, Spanish battalion, has been broken. And so at the bottom of the picture, you can see Isguiedo trying to bring forward some ne Neapolitans to steady the ship. Around Fort Morgrave, not much happened as Brule retired because the uh, the gunners in the redoubt couldn't see the the approaching French columns. So here we are at the end of uh, French turn seven, and you can see the overview here. And the key result this turn is that the Fort St Louis redoubt was finally captured by Victor's men, uh, the uh, Spanish defenders being broken. And uh, the victorious uh, French column, which had already seen off one Spanish battalion, also forced the Neapolitan battalion that was coming out to uh, um, uh, challenge them back towards the Fort d'Aguilette. Um, and both units ended up shaken in their turn. So if we look at the goings on around Fort Mulgrave, this ended up being very sad for the French. Their, their command roles are very poor, giving them only one uh, move into contact. And uh, because they're moving at half speed and you need six centimetres uh, to actually close into close combat, it meant the uh, columns were all just short of actually being able to uh, fight the melees. Meanwhile, Brule's uh, defeated brigade 
as we're drawing back towards uh, Toulon itself. And here you can see the situation at the end of Allied Turn 7. And uh, uh, this is a, an overview shot as before. And here you can see the Neapolitans forming a last line of defence at uh, uh, Fort d'Aguilette uh, with uh, Isguedo in uh, close assistance. Um, you can see the situation here around um, uh, uh, Fort Mulgrave. Um, at this point, I made a mistake uh, because I'd, uh, in, in testing to see whether the Allied brigade was broken or not, I'd inadvertently counted in a couple of uh, shaken tiny units, which don't count. And so you can see the skirmishers have withdrawn along with a a unit of uh, Spanish uh, infantry that was uh, marched up in support, uh, but it's outside of a defensive position, so I had to withdraw. So all of that is actually wrong, but uh, I've only realized uh, at the end of the game. So with the French so close, but so far, the uh, Allied uh, artillery in the Mulgrave fort were able to pour withering fire on the two uh, attacking formations before them and this was enough to uh, create the two shaken results they needed to break both Bonaparte's reserve brigade and Delabor's brigade and that meant that uh, at the beginning of turn eight effectively the game uh, for the French the game is over because uh, they've uh, lost uh, more than two of their four brigades So time for some conclusions. Um, in the game so far, uh, there was two different games at the other Partisan and the one I filmed here. Uh, the French actually have won twice and lost once. So I guess it tells you that the scenario can be val balanced even though the French vastly outnumber the uh, defending allies. So the number of artillery models to use to represent the artillery in Fort Mulgrave is still an open question. As I said, in this game, I used four models rather than the three I used at the other partisan. And that may have uh, made the difference um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the result. Um, I, I think when I get to salute, uh, I'm probably going to make this a die roll exercise. Um, uh, as opposed to deciding one way or the other beforehand. Uh, but it is hard to know exactly how many guns were fully functional on the night. And finally, the, uh, uh, the other conclusion is, I, I, even, even though I do say so myself, I like the visibility rules. I think having different visibilities for the, um, uh, the different columns reflects what happened in history. Uh, it creates more confusion that stops the French rolling over the Allies too easily. I think the um, you might ask why I don't just roll uh, the D20 instead of um, uh, rolling 3D6. I think you get a, uh, a more reasonable uh, distribution of results if you uh, use the 3D6 uh, result, but each to his own, I suppose. Uh, the blunder rules uh, that are modified from the black powder standard ones certainly seem to work and give the French that lack of control that uh, you'd associate with a night action. So in terms of what actually happened on, on the, uh, uh, in, in the history of the, the, the campaign, Fort Morgrave and Fort St. Louis were actually taken by the French Republicans and uh, that same night, uh, and Napoleon got Marmont, uh, who was also with him, to organise such that the guns that were captured could be turned on the Allied shipping. And uh, two days later, uh, after a council of war, the Allies did indeed evacuate uh, Toulon, and uh, Napoleon became uh, um, famous for the first time and was uh, earned a promotion to uh, general de brigade uh, as a result of uh, uh, this campaign.
So thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video. Um, and uh, if you want to see the game in person and even take part in it, because as I say, it is a participation game where the participants take the roles of one of the French column commanders, you can see us at Salute uh, this year. If you've enjoyed this video, which I hope you have, please uh, like and subscribe it. I, I, as I implied, I have 30 odd other videos uh, related to various aspects of my wargaming and I've got a growing body of videos of the scenarios in my new book uh, Throw in Thunderbolts which uh, could do with all the love it can, can, you can give it so please buy me as it says so thank you very much and goodbye